Oh, bird going in the wilderness Got his army in an awful mess The farmers got mad at the British and the Huns And they captured 10,000 of the son of a gun all right, what we're going to do here today is we're real quickly going to run through the Battle of Saratoga and its importance, and of course the events leading up to it, and the consequences. Now, you need to know that the British really weren't all that concerned after the losses at Trenton and Princeton. No, they weren't discouraged. They basically knew the Patriot Army was still in a pitiful state, and they still felt that victory could be theirs very quickly. Now this is where this guy named Johnny Burgoyne comes into the picture. Very important in this lesson uh, that you kind of understand his personality. He was born rich and married disgustingly rich. So he's one of those guys, the British did this often, you know, you were from from elite prestigious family, they gave you some high appointment in the army, and it's not necessarily clear that this guy ever really knew what he was doing. Uh, he was also a flamboyant ladies man he allowed women to travel with his army and his soldiers called him gentleman johnny this is because of his wealthy upbringing and his gentlemanly manner uh when i say ladies man he was the real deal i mean he was actually having said to be having a fling with general howe's wife now general howe didn't care because he was having all these flings of his own uh, didn't chase Washington's army uh, to Trenton basically because he was off you know doing other things and he was even having an affair with his quartermaster's wife so he doesn't necessarily seem to care a whole lot so I guess we can say this about the British officers they enjoyed having a good time now Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne did like devising plans, and he actually comes up with this British plan for victory. It's going to be a three-pronged attack with three different British armies. The first will be commanded by him. He'll come down from Canada. The second would be an army made up of loyalist and Native American Indian allies. It was going to be led by Barry St. Leger. And the third prong was supposed to be General Howe's army. Now, the plan makes sense. These three armies converge, force Washington into a spot where they can trap him, cut off the New England colonies where the war is going on. British win the war. Now the problem is, General Howe never seemed at all interested in carrying this plan out. I don't know that he and Johnny Burgoyne hated each other, but at times it kind of seems like that. He decides, uh, I'm not going to take orders from him, I'm the big wig. And he decides he's going to go capture Philadelphia. And he was able to get away with this by saying, oh, this will actually help Burgoyne's scheme because I will lure Washington away. That will open New England up. The other two armies can cut him off. I'll capture Philadelphia. It will destroy uh, Patriot morale. And, of course, this is the colonial capital. So that used to be the ways you kind of win wars. But this doesn't really work. Now, Washington does follow him. Hal was right about that. Given the choice, Washington's going to pursue him. So, the two armies are going to clash at a place called Brandywine. Now, the Patriots have to try and defend the capital, even if they're not going to be able to do it. You have to make a show. This was the capital city. It was a center of trade and commerce, the wealthiest city in the American colonies. And it's also the second largest city in the British Empire at that time, uh, behind only London. Kind of a fascinating side note there. So, these two armies are going to clash at Brandywine, and the Americans are going to be soundly defeated. Not only are they going to be soundly defeated, Washington's going to lose close to 10% of his army in this battle. 1,200 soldiers killed or wounded, and one of the few American heroes in this battle actually wasn't an American at all. It was a 20-year-old named Marquis de Lafayette, who was a Frenchman, was over here fighting with the American colonists, basically out of admiration and, of course, hatred for the British. And he actually was from one of the wealthiest families in France, paid for him and his men to come over here, actually donated a lot of money and food and supplies to the American cause, and Washington kind of adopted him as a son-like figure. You know, you hear a father-like figure. I've never heard of son-like figure, but that's kind of what Marquis was. 
Marquis actually gets wounded trying to rally a group of American soldiers who are retreating. Uh, even after being wounded, he still tried to form a counter charge, actually gets hit again. And when Washington finds Lafayette, he is so weak from the loss of blood that he cannot even carry himself. So Washington picks him up personally, carries him to his own physician, and says, take care of him as if he were my son. Now, the fact that we lost here, not good, because the British are going to keep moving toward Philadelphia. The two armies are going to meet again a few days later at a place called Germantown. Same thing happens. Washington's army gets sweeped out of the way. The road is open to Philadelphia. General Howe captures it. Now, this isn't the resounding victory that Howe hoped it would be. Congress just picked up and left for York. And that was our capital for a short while. So, without General Howe, Burgoyne's going to march on towards uh, carrying out the plan himself. Now, Marquis de Lafayette, more on this guy later, kind of a fascinating figure, uh, big American hero, you know, we got cities and stuff named after Lafayette, but more on him when we get to the uh, lesson about Valley Forge, but very interesting character indeed. So, Burgoyne is going to be like, I'm going to carry this out myself, I don't really care, I'll just do it. Now, he does move along, he does recapture Fort Ticonderoga, and when King George hears about the recapturing of Ticonderoga, he actually runs into his wife's quarters, she had her own private space, I guess, and he goes running in and like starts jumping up and down the bed and is like, I've defeated the Americans, I've defeated all of them. But from there, Burgoyne is going to have a miserable time. He's going to be harassed the entire way, not just by the colonial army, but by militiamen who are kind of angry that the British are practicing these scorched earth tactics, burning farmers' fields and stuff, trying to hurt the American war effort. So they take the opportunity to kind of hide in trees and in bushes and take cheap shots at Burgoyne's army as they're marching along. So this is a slow pace. Colonists are cutting down trees in his path. Just he's moving along at like a snail's pace. And the American army that's actually sent up there to stop him is commanded by Horatio Gates. Now, Horatio Gates was not a popular commander during the war. The American soldiers really didn't like him. Uh, he was very slow, very reserved. You know, European military type education. Uh, always kind of looked down upon the Americans as not being real soldiers. So he kind of had this arrogant presence to him. The soldiers actually called him Granny Gates because he was old, he had gray hair, and he wore his glasses down on the tip of his nose like this. Hello, I'm General Gates and you listen to me. So they didn't call him that to his face, of course, but Troops didn't really like him, and he sent up there very cautious commander. His second in command is Benedict Arnold, who's recovered from his wounds outside of Quebec. And, of course, he's the exact opposite. Younger, more aggressive, always wanting to go on the offensive, just attack, 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 never give up ground to the enemy. These two guys are not well suited to be working together. And on top of that, they've both got these massive gigantic egos. So they're going to be stepping on each other's feet. And the British are slowly going to get there. They're going to arrive. The Americans have fortified on this place called Bemis Heights. And Burgoyne has no respect for the American army. He's just going to come right at Gates and attack him. Gates understands military strategy enough to know, hey, this is a brilliant thing. We dig in, they attack us, we mow them down. But Arnold's the kind, they make a mistake, we need to seize the initiative. These guys are going to butt heads big time here. And it's actually going to lead to a lot of trouble. The Americans are also getting more good news. Benedict Arnold, one of his best fighters, Daniel Morgan, returns via prisoner exchange. So Virginia Long Rifles back in action. And the area around Saratoga was perfectly suited to the American style of fighting. Hit and run tactics, using the woods to shield your uh, movements, launch an ambush, set a trap. So 
the Americans are like, yeah, this is looking great for an American victory. So, when the fighting starts, Arnold's actually out on the field. Gates was one of those, I'm going to stay back in the rear areas. I'm not going to get up close where there's any danger. He's going to try to manage the battle rather than lead the battle. Arnold loved the sting of combat, man. He's right up there in the middle of it. And the entire time he's commanding this battle, he keeps sending back to Gates, send me more men, send me more men. Gates won't do it. Arnold actually rides to the headquarters and says, Ma'am, we need some men. We need to go on the offensive. And Gates refuses. In fact, Gates says, You're not even in command anymore, buddy. You stay here. Arnold didn't care. He's a fighter. He goes back out, disobeys the orders, actually captures some British supplies, doesn't have enough men to hold the position, unfortunately has to set it on fire, burn them. So, the British, at the end of this first day's fighting at Saratoga, they lost like 900 men. The Americans lost 300. This hurt both armies badly, but it really stung the British. And after this day's fighting over, Gates files his report, doesn't even really mention Benedict Arnold. He's just, I did this, I did this. Oh, great, we're in a good position. Now, after this, about 17 days are going to pass. The armies are right there facing each other, but they're not going to fight. Burgoyne wanted to attack the next day, but his men talk him out of it. They're like, dude, this is crazy. You don't want to go out there and, you know, we lost enough men yesterday. We need to wait on the reinforcements. Now, these reinforcements are very important to the British because 3,000 men under the command of uh, General Clinton, they're going to come out and they are going to uh, reinforce his army. And Arnold catches wind of this. He's like, we've got to go and attack. We've got to seize the initiative. You know, we just can't sit here and wait for more British soldiers to arrive. And Gates is like, nah, 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 you shut up. I'm in command. So he actually sets about the process of trying to court martial Benedict Arnold and take credit for his victory. So while the American commanders are sitting there arguing, Burgoyne probably should have attacked. The Americans were in a very desperate spot. They were so low on ammunition they had to actually send soldiers into neighboring villages to tear the sashes off the insides of the windows you know, and melt that stuff down into bullets. They're literally in that bad of shape. But Burgoyne's army, they're suffering too. His problem is his army's like on the verge of starvation. So Arnold's taunting Gates. We need to attack. And... Gates strips Arnold of command and basically says, you just shut up, I'm sick of you, I've had enough of you. So, Burgoyne's like, I've got to do something. Clinton never shows up, Clinton never shows up, Clinton never shows up, so he's like, I'm just going to go on attack. And the next day's fighting erupts, and over two weeks later, Arnold, when he hears the sounds of fighting, you can't keep him away, man. He's like a He's like a pit bull wanting to get into a scrap. He's like, no, I see him, I see him, I'm going to go get him. So Arnold, even though he's been stripped of command, he runs out or rides out toward the battlefield. He sees the American army in disarray. He sees a group of American infantrymen fleeing. He's like, turn around, I'm here, boys. We're going to go on to victory. And the American army rallies behind Benedict Arnold. And he turns the tide of the battle. Burgoyne now finds himself in a tight spot. The battle comes his direction. He actually gets his hat shot off. There are bullet holes in his vest. His horse gets shot out from underneath him. His coat is all tethered you know, in the breeze behind him. And he's like fleeing the battlefield. And Arnold, when he sees this opportunity, he's like, you know what? It's time to party. So we've been sitting around for 17 days. No more. He takes command of the American army, charges forward into the British encampment. We're literally running into their turf. They're fleeing across their encampment. We're charging in. Arnold's leading the way, bravely on the horse. And he's like, victory or death. And he actually leaps over into the British embattlements on his horse. His horse gets shot. He gets hit again in the same leg that was wounded at Quebec. The horse actually rolls over him. He's sitting there in tremendous amount of pain, but he's still urging the Americans on. He's like, onward to victory, boys. Onward to victory. So this is the difference. Arnold leads from the front. He inspires the American army to victory. And at one point in this battle, before he actually got shot, 
Uh, there was only one British commander out there even showing any semblance of uh, any order at all. And there's this guy named Simon Fraser. The rest of the British armies fled. This one guy named Simon Fraser's out there trying to rally the British army. And Arnold said, we got to get rid of that guy. So he goes to Morgan and he's like, that man is a host unto himself and needs to be disposed of. So Arnold goes and gets his best sharpshooter, Tim Murphy. He's like, you see that guy? Take him out. Tim Murphy climbs up a tree, takes three shots to get him. But, you know, the Americans, we broke the rules of war. You're not supposed to shoot the officers. They're gentlemen from ex esteemed families. And the British opinion is, man, it'll be chaos if these educated elite officers from the Patrician class aren't out there leading the men. Well, they kind of had a point. Murphy nearly hits them, buzzes them a second time. The, th the third shot's true. At that point, the British resistance just disintegrates. So that's when Arnold leads his men on. That's when he gets wounded. But the British army is in chaos. And they retreat. I mean, only darkness saves this army from being decimated. And at that point, the British have to retreat from Saratoga. And the British retreat, it's awful. I mean, they're barely moving along like at two miles per day. They have to leave 300 wounded men behind, along with a note saying, please, please pity them. You know, because the Hessians had killed American soldiers in the past when they tried to surrender. And the British were scared that the Americans were going to slaughter these guys. So they're trying to leave. And they wake up one morning, and their road is blocked. Not by the colonial army, uh, but by colonial militia. And these are the guys that are angry, man. The British burned their farms, so they armed themselves, followed the British army in, waited for a chance to uh, capture them. So the British only made it like eight miles from the battlefield when they completely got surrounded. And on October 17th, 1777, a very big deal occurred. On that morning, the British realized they were trapped. Johnny Burgoyne was sick of fighting and he said, I'm going to surrender. Now this is a huge, huge, huge thing. For the first time in this war, an entire British army surrenders to the Americans. And Burgoyne is so tired of the conflict that he even puts it in the uh, terms of the surrender. If you allow my men to go home, we promise they will not be put into action again against the Americans. Now, after the surrender, and Gates is going to get to write this report, he is not even going to mention Arnold's actions in the fight. All that he mentions in the report is his insubordination. And in fact, Gates is like, this guy needs to be court-martialed. He needs to be removed from the army. He's dangerous. Uh, he nearly snatched victory here away from us with the jaws of defeat from his recklessness. You know, I told him to stay in his tent. He didn't. He disobeyed me. Dude needs to be disciplined, kicked out of the army. So, Gates is once again going to claim credit. He's going to say, Court Martial Benedict Arnold. Uh, you can see there's kind of a pattern going on here. And Gates does have ulterior motives. He's like, Washington's army's been getting crushed by General Howe. I just won the hugest victory. Hugest? I just won the largest victory of the war for our side. I might just get George Washington's job. Now, news of this, of course, is going to travel fast for fast back then. You know, when the French hear about this, they're like, ah, ha, ha, they think this is hilarious. The British army, one of their armies, surrenders to the uh, country bumpkin Americans. That's great. And Ben Franklin shows up and he's like, yeah, you know, we, uh, we won. You know, we can actually win this war. You believe us now? The French are like, you bet we do. So this battle, not only is it seen as the turning point of the revolution, the Americans are going to gain the upper hand again, really start marching towards victory. But France, they're going to recognize the United States of America. King Louis is going to start sending some help. Uh, the French Navy is going to get involved. They're going to start loaning more money. And eventually, they're going to get troops to send over here to help the Americans win. 
So, the Battle of Saratoga, huge victory for the Americans. Big time game changer. And of course, we'll see you on the other side with the next lesson. The Americans are still going to have to go suffer through Valley Forge. That's not going to be much fun at all.